Hey, good morning. This is Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and I'm happy to be here on, what is today, the 16th, March 16th, to, as usual, answer any questions you have, any non-spoiler questions to discuss random topics and to share some Stillmeyer Games news. Um, I'm glad to see Facebook Live is working. I've been trying to get it to work for my Rolling Realms live plays recently, and it hasn't worked all that well. So I, I'm glad it looks like at least that is back working now. And um, for the live play, I'm going to... I think I'm going to start switching it up. So with Rolling Realms, I do these live plays one round at a time of, uh, of the different realms and Rolling, and Rolling Realms. And I've been doing it like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I think I'm going to start doing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then the next week, I'll shift from Wednesday over to Saturday. And then I'll skip the next week and then go to Wednesday. So I'll kind of do every week and a half and do it on different days. So that way I'll cover over the course of three weeks, I'll cover Wednesday through Monday, really. I have a live play on a bunch of different days to make it more accessible to people who maybe aren't available on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, hey, Chad, Navia, John, Brian, thanks for, for joining me this morning. Good to see you all. Brian, uh, Brian's one of our, uh, our amazing proofreaders on our oversight team. Thanks, Brian, for, for joining us. Brian has been working on a project that he can't talk about, but um, there is a project in motion right now that we're in the proofreading stages for, ready to wrap it up pretty soon. And Brian has been really helpful with that. And Tony is here today as well. Uh, what, at Stillmeyer Games, the other, so proofreading has been a big thing that I've been doing recently. Um, and a lot of playtesting too, both uh, local playtesting and talking to, uh, like going through playtesting feedback from, uh, from blind playtest. I'm talking slowly because I don't want to give anything away by accident. But yeah, it's, a, it's interesting to see both sides of the process. For me to be a playtester, me offer feedback and try to, you know, uh, present essentially present myself feedback, but also to go through feedback from um, from other playtesters and figure that out. I see uh, Big Dan is here this morning, Director Dan. I had a uh, Dan was very kind to to give me some of his time last week. I think it was last week. Was that right? To chat about um, to chat about something about a product, a, a pro an upcoming product, and inclusivity and um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go too deep into it right now because you'll, you'll know more about it later. But Dan, thank you for your time recently. It was wonderful to talk to you and to get your, um, I don't even want to say your perspective. It was your perspective, but it was much more than that. Your insights uh, on uh, some things that we can do a little better with an upcoming product. I really appreciate that. Thanks for your help with that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about what uh, the solutions that we came up with in that discussion. Carlos is here. He says, I enjoyed your video, my top 10 favorite games as of March 2022. Yeah, that's right. I put every six months I post my favorite games and I just posted that video this past Sunday. Uh, Carlos says, seeing that two of your top 10 games were from designer Paul Denon, I wonder if you be if you would consider asking him if he would be interested in Still Games publishing for one of his next games. It's not unprecedented. You did something similar with Paolo Mori. It was a little different with Paolo, but yeah, I mean. Paul is a designer I have found that I really, really like. The two games of his that I really enjoy are um, Clank and um, and uh, Dune Imperium. And I mean, I would love to work with Paul. The I think the catch there is that Paul works for Dire Wolf Games. So he is, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure he is a full-time employee there, kind of an in-house designer, and he does some other things for them. So I highly doubt that he would design a game for Stonemaier Games, but, um, but I have actually wondered that myself. And at the very least, I should reach out to Paul just to say that I like his work. I feel like I may have done that. I, I, th I feel like I'm having deja vu here. I feel like I may have gone on Board Game Geek and just told Paul that I really love his work. But if I haven't done that, and Paul, you're watching this, I really love your work. And if you ever want to design a game for Stonemaier Games, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, but I'm pretty sure I sent him a private message at some point, but I don't think I got a response, so I don't, I don't know if... Uh, if he checks those messages on Board Game Geek. Uh, Daniel's joining us from Costa Rica. Very nice. Tim says, how's the weather in St. Louis? It's actually been really, really nice here. Tim says he experienced quite a range over the weekend from Cleveland to Evansville. Um, yeah, it's been pretty nice. The, the, the weather was beautiful on Sunday, and we hosted Megan's brother and sister-in-law for just a few hours. They came down to look at a house here in St. Louis. So we spent some time with them looking at the house, showing them a coffee shop near that house that we really enjoy, and playing disc golf for a few hours over at, um, at Wilmore. I, I posted a photo. If you check out Instagram today, you can see a photo of me kind of in the brush at Wilmore trying to get a putt out of uh, a little... Uh, a brushy area at Wilmore. 
Francesco's here today. I'm glad Francesco's here because I actually just played the very most recent game that I played was Francesco's game Momiji. And Francesco, I played it just yesterday for the first time. I got it on Kickstarter a while ago and uh, I really enjoyed my first play. It's a really nice abstract game, but with beautiful art that makes you forget that it's an abstract game. Um, yeah, great job with that, Francesco. And I'll be talking about that on my YouTube channel soon. Some other things that I've created recently um, are in terms of like content. I, I did the, the video about my favorite games right now. I also wrote an article last Thursday about um, women who work at Stonemaier Games in various capacities, a number of different capacities, such as uh, Susanna, who was our retailer relationship manager, um, uh, our designers, artists, uh, uh, independent contractors like Brian that I mentioned. Brian does some work with proofreading, people like that. Um, just kind of to celebrate, uh, last, last I think Monday was International Women's Day. And uh, no, it was Tuesday. It was Tuesday. And I write blog posts on Monday, Thursday. So I wrote a blog post kind of celebrating the many amazing women who have contributed their time and talent to Stillmeyer Games uh, for, for, uh, for pay. Uh, I think it's important that we pay the people that contribute so positively to Stillmeyer Games and to other companies. And uh, I wanted to celebrate the women who, who, who uh, are a part of that process and who make our games better every day uh, as part of that blog post. I also posted on Monday about a TV show called Coronation Street in the UK that happened to use Wingspan in one of their scenes recently. And I, I wrote a blog post that shows that scene. You can see a, a big tweet from Elizabeth Hargrave in that, in that post on Monday. And I talk about the process of getting a uh, game onto a TV show, which is actually much, I don't know, I don't want to say easier, but maybe much different than you imagine. Uh, it's literally a show every now and then contacts a publisher, contacts us, Stumeyer Games, and says, hey, we want to use your game in a scene. Do we have your permission to do that? And of course the answer is yes. I don't think they really, really need our permission. We're going to say yes to that, of course. And that's it. That's usually the end of it. That's, that's all that happens. Um, so if you want to read a little bit more about that process and some other examples of games that have appeared on TV shows, somewhat randomly almost, uh, feel free to check out Monday's blog post. Tim says that Libertalia is out for delivery. Yes. So we are, <laughs> we are, I laugh a little bit because now is the kind of the weird time in delivering a pre-order where we scramble a little bit because uh, at this point, so we're what, nine days, 10 days? No, we're almost, how many business, we're two weeks, not business days, but we're two weeks into the Libertalia pre-order at this. And at this point, all champion orders should have shipped and most of them should have been delivered, but all of them should have been shipped from our four fulfillment centers. So if you were a summer champion and you haven't gotten your shipment not shipping notification, um, you can contact Joe at stonemeyergames.com. They should have all shipped by this point, all the champion orders and all the non-champion orders should be shipping this week. But this is the week where we find out that there are anomalies and things that don't haven't gone quite as planned. Sometimes we hear it from fulfillment centers. Usually we hear it from customers, both sides are valid. We want to hear that so we can fix it, especially for the champions because their order should have shipped for non-champions. Feel free to wait until the end of this week to start worrying about it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just kind of a, a weird, awkward time where like 95% of everything is fine. And there are a few weird orders that we don't know why they didn't ship or what happened. And we're trying to hunt them down and figure that out. So I appreciate your patience, but, uh, if you are a champion and you, you haven't gotten a shipment notification, you definitely should have by now and, uh, let us know so we can work on that. Corey says that he just got Geekway to the West badges and the hotel booked for his wife and him. That's awesome, Corey. Uh, Geekway to the West is my favorite convention to just sit down and play games for a few days. It's here in St. Louis. Um, I advocate it as if I'm getting something out of it, but really I'm not. I'm just an attendee at Geekway to the West and I like to have people come to, to St. Louis and play games with me. And so that's what's happening uh, with Geekway, a convention that will happen in mid-May. So Corey, that's really awesome. I'm excited to hopefully play a game with you there. Tony says that his team played Libertalia for the first time last night, two games. He said the group really liked it, and he has to say that he really liked the game, really enjoyed the game, and the components and the artwork are really top-notch. Uh, he says, am I using really too much? Tony, I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, we put a lot of love into this game, and I, I'm glad that it brought you joy. I mean, that's, that's why we do it, and uh, yeah, I'm really happy to hear that. Thanks for sharing that, and for sharing the game with your, your group. Shai says, cool shirt. Yeah, this is a Stillmeyer shirt. This is one of the few shirts that we allow to have the Stillmeyer trademark, the Stillmeyer names, that isn't actually made by us. This is made by Meeple Source. Uh, Meeple Source has a pretty wide variety of Stillmeyer Games t-shirts. We do allow uh, third-party creators to, to create shirts and accessories and apparel 
related to Stillmeyer Games, but we usually don't let them put our trademark terms on it, but we have a special relationship with, with Meeple Source, and so we let them do it. And plus, I just like the idea of a Stillmeyer Vineyard. Uh, Adam says, thanks for responding to my question on your top 10 video on YouTube. My wife thinks we should try Arc Nova, and I told her about how people really like Viticulture, and she thinks we should pick that one up as well. I'm certainly happy for you to pick up Viticulture. Uh, you can tell by the shirt, I am a fan, <laughs> and I am the designer. And uh, if you want to ramp up to Arc Nova, Arc Nova is definitely hev heavier than Viticulture, so you could start with Viticulture and ramp up to a heavier game like Arc Nova if you want. But I also love Arc Nova. Feel free to jump in and, and, uh, and see if you enjoy it as much as I do. I did just get to play that again um, this past weekend, a four-player game, and I almost won for the first time. It came really, really close between me and another player. But it's one of those games that even if I don't win, I have fun achieving lots of intrinsic goals throughout the game, goals that I set for myself. Like I, I have a difficult-to-play animal, and I, I finally play it, and that feels really good in the game, whether or not I actually win the game. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really, really loving Arc Nova. The other game that I played recently was Unfathomable. I played that at game night uh, last week, last Wednesday. This is uh, the game that's kind of the sequel to Battlestar Galactica, a rethemed, refurbished, refurbished, refreshed version of Battlestar Galactica. And I had a lot of fun with it. It's not the type of game that I think I'll get to the table a lot, but I'm glad to play this, this style of game, kind of a semi-cooperative, traitorish game that lasts around two and a half to three hours. That style of game is one that I like to visit every now and then. Not every game night, but every now and then. And I had fun with my first play of it. I'll be talking that, about that on a YouTube video soon as well. Chad says, when you're designing, do you tend to put as many mechanisms, cool stuff, and the kitchen sink into your game and then trim down the mechanisms to the most streamlined version? Or do you trim as you go to maintain the most streamlined version from the start? It's a good question. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, streamlining is an eventual goal for sure. I wouldn't say it's uh, typically a goal from the beginning. Usually I'm putting a lot of different ideas on paper and then I'm choosing the ideas that seem to mesh well mechanically and thematically into the game. And typically, not by any uh, uh, purpose or design, but the first few prototypes of a game that I design usually end up being a little bit too simple and I need to add complexity and often some level of asymmetry later. Uh, so I, I usually try to start off simple and get kind of the foundation of the game working, and then I add complexity and layers onto it. But I often find myself, you know, a few months in the, into the design process, and I have to have that moment where I'm like, this just isn't, there isn't enough here. I need to add more to it. And then later on, there's often the moment where I've added too much and I have to trim a little bit. But usually I, I am adding um, variety and complexity and different abilities and things like that as I go. Um, instead of uh, instead of trimming and cutting and streamlining, yeah. Molly says that she would love to see a Paul Denon. I think Molly's referring to this. Uh, she would love to see a Paul uh, Denon game in the Stonemaier Games lineup as well. She says with Clank being my wife's favorite game and Viticulture being mine, it would be a dream team. That would be really cool. It would be it would be fun to work with Paul. I mean, he he makes deck building, um, he makes it look easy. But it really, really is not easy. I have tried to design deck building games several times over the years and have failed every time. And Paul has come out with two, I think, of the best deck building games ever designed, Dune Imperium and Clank. Uh, and so I, I, I know it, make it look, he makes it look easy, but it, I'm sure it is not easy behind the scenes. He has done a lot of work and a lot of playtesting to get that right, I'm sure. Um, and I've read some of his uh, Dune, Dune Imperium design diaries, so I, I kind of know that that's the process that he's gone through, but I, I'm just amazed with what he's done. Gerald says, how exactly do you choose such good game names? Thank you, Gerald. Uh, I think you don't run a poll. I don't run a poll. No, in the end, you decide which one you personally think sounds best. A lot of it comes down to that. Yeah, I mean, usually I brainstorm a few names. Sometimes if I'm working with a designer, they might have some ideas for a name. And I also have a great group of shareholders. So if I'm debating between a few names, I will uh, throw it by them. And sometimes I have no ideas for names and I'll throw it by them, throw, throw it in front of them up front and say, hey, looking for a name, here's the, the spirit of the game. Uh, what are your ideas? And then I'll go through that list and call in. Usually one will really speak to me or one or two will really speak to me. But it's all, I've always found it good that at some point in that process to run it by someone else. For example, for Euphoria, the original game name for the game, the game that I thought was best for the game was just the word dystopia. Um, Again, a name that I still like, I think it's a good name, but Alan really pushed me to change that to Euphoria um, and then add a subtitle that refers to, to, to the dystopia, build a better dystopia. 
And uh, I think that was a great change. I think uh, dystopia, just the word can have some dark connotation, connotations to it, which is good. I mean, we, we in Euphoria, it's kind of dark, but it's tongue in cheek as well. But uh, I'm glad he gave it a more, added more levity to the name um, and also to the subtitle than if we had gone with dystopia. So I, I think it's really good when, um, at some point in the, during that process for me to run the names by someone else or multiple other people, but not a general poll. I don't, I don't like doing just a general big poll for the name of the game. Chris says that he just got his shipping notification for Rolling Realms. And <laughs> Tim says in the, in the Coronation Street scene, there is a character who is reading the appendix and another character who I think is reading the rule book. And it is a little funny to see. Like the character is clearly just a, pretending to read the appendix. I don't think most people lounge around reading the wingspan appendix, more something that you refer to, but it's a good prop for the scene. I think it works well. Kevin's champion order is, is arriving soon. Justin from Room 51 says, are there any trends you were seeing in the board game industry that you're not a fan of? Trends that I'm not a fan of. Uh, hmm. In the board game industry. Oh, that's a big topic, Justin. Um, I mean, the one that I talked about a little bit over the last year, but that I can relate to a little bit more now is... Uh, the a really basically really high Kickstarter prices for games that I know don't cost enough to justify that price for direct sales. Um, uh, but I get it more and more, I think, as, as we see freight shipping costs go up. I mean, they, they really do eat into that. But it just surprised me from time to time when I know like that the cost of the game where a game might cost $15 to make and they're gonna charge shipping separately, so shipping doesn't really matter, and freight shipping might be cost a little bit more than normal, so total freight shipping plus the game might cost a little over $20, but for the Kickstarter, the company is charging $100. Um, that to me just seems a little odd, and in the end, if a company can, can add that much value to the game, and the customer can pay $100 on Kickstarter plus the shipping they add later, and they can feel good about that, they feel like they're getting the full value out of the game, that's great. I mean, that's that's a full win win for everyone involved. But uh, but I, I started to think about this and to bring it up, bring up the topic last year when I started to see it happening a lot, because I was worried that those campaigns were leaving behind a number of backers who might otherwise back them if they discounted the price a little bit and still had a hugely healthy margin between those sunk costs and their ongoing costs like royalties and the total uh, price they charge for the game. So that's something that I still continue to see. I have. I, but in the end, it's about creating a win-win proposition, I think, for the publisher, a sustainable proposition for the publisher, and a win for the backer or the customer. And if they're able to do both of those, even with a higher price, go for it. Absolutely. It just worries me when, um, when I think they're leaving some people behind um, and kind of forgetting about how much margin is there when you are selling directly. A lot of people say in their Libertalia is is moving towards them, <laughs> some faster than others. I, I really do appreciate your patience and I hope it arrives today or tomorrow for all of you champions who have been waiting for it. Uh, Enyev says, what about the, the new Viticulture expansion? I am excited to start talking about the new Viticulture expansion soon. Um, I think we're aiming for mid-April for me to start talking about that. Uh, yeah, but it's coming up soon. Uh, I'm looking forward to, really, really I'm looking forward to start talking about that. Nicholas says, you mentioned disc golf, but where where do you and Megan go rock climbing and does she enjoy Ascent or other climbing games? We haven't played, oh, I don't know if I played Ascent. I backed a game I think called First Ascent on Kickstarter, but we haven't received it yet. Um, we've played Summit. Summit is I think the only like hiking rock climbing game that we've played so far. Uh, we go rock climbing in St. Louis, or we, we haven't been in a while, to be honest, due to the, the pandemic, but we used to go at a place called Climb So Ill in downtown St. Louis. It's a great climbing gym. Carl says that he was happy to get Libertalia on the table last weekend for a two-player game. Not having played the original, we did have to learn what we played, but after a quick watch with Rodney from Watch It Played, it was easy to jump in. Great two-player variant rules. I'm glad to hear that on all accounts, that you enjoy the two-player rules, and uh, I, I, I agree, Rodney does a wonderful job with Watch It Played. I'm glad you found that helpful for learning the game. Justin also said he played a solo game of Libertalia. Really enjoyed it. Probably one of his favorite Altama systems in a Stillmeyer game. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I think I saw your post on the Libertalia Facebook group as well, and I was really happy to hear that. I love the solo modes that Team Altama, Altama Factory creates for our games. 
David says, was the difficult to play animal in your Ark Nova game, the giant panda? I finally managed to play one a few days ago and it was exciting. That's awesome, David. One of those intrinsic goals in Ark Nova. No, the one that, well, for me, the one that I, what was it that I tried to play? Um, oh, shoot, I'm going to forget it now. I was going after a lot of primates. I think it was a gorilla, but I'm forgetting exactly what it was now. I, I should remember, I would just played this on Saturday. I'm forgetting the animal, but it was an animal that required a lot of stuff for me to play. And uh, man, it was, it was really expensive. It required a bunch of icons, but I worked towards it. I got to play it. I felt so good to do that. What was it? I'm forgetting now. Let me see. I'll, I'll pull it up on my phone while I'm talking about the next question to see if I can find it. Because um, I did take some photos of the game. So Greg says, happy to report his copy of Libertalia arrived in plenty of time to uh, to learn it and play it and add it to the hot game section of the Oklahoma Token Con this weekend. Also, would like to provide a personal thank you to some of our games for the play to win titles donated to the convention. Much appreciated. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm to really glad that worked out. Uh, cutting it a little close with a few days there on our part, not your part, but uh, but I, that's very generous of you to, to share Libertalia with the gaming library there at uh, Token Con. Okay, let me look through photos real quick to see if I can find the Arc Nova card that I tried so hard to play. What was it? It required five spaces. Oh, I don't think I see it here. No, I can't find it. Sorry. So the chocolate of the day, I don't, I, so I am eating chocolate every day, of course, but uh, recently we went to a local uh, Asian grocery store and picked up, we bought a few high chew there and uh, that's been kind of one of my treats of choice recently. This is a Japanese chewy food. It's kind of like, kind of like gum, but it ends up dissolving, maybe more like taffy. Um, and I studied abroad in Japan several times, a long time ago, and Haichu were one of my favorite treats back then. So it's, it has this, and they taste good, and there's this feeling of nostalgia whenever I have a Haichu. So that is my, my treat of the day today. Dan says, uh, have you seen or heard anything about the Solar 175 on Kickstarter? He says it's a sci-fi legacy game from Cardiff designers here in Wales. Uh, they are using the recharge pack idea used in Charterstone to make it replayable. It's a Euro bag builder worker placement game. It looks really fun with incredible world building. I have, Dan. I, I followed it pretty closely early on in the campaign. Um, I really like the team at, uh, at the company that makes it. Uh, I'm forgetting the name right now, but they have a YouTube channel, uh, Cog Cognito Design. And um, I am following it. I haven't backed it yet. It's one of those games that is above the typical price range that I typically that I normally back for a game. And I feel like a little maybe overwhelmed with campaign games right now. Um, but it looks really cool. It looks really, really cool. And so I'm excited to learn more, um, but I haven't backed it yet. So I'm, I'm kind of right, right there on the fence right now on it. But I agree with you on everything you said here. It does look really cool. And I, I love that they're from Wales. Um, I, I have I really no real connection to Wales, but I, I was writing a novel about Wales years ago and traveled to Wales. Didn't go to Cardiff. We went to, to Hay on Wye and we went to uh, uh, Tenby and a few other places in Wales. But, uh, but yeah, I have it, it, it just it, always neat to hear that there's a creator from Wales doing some cool stuff on Kickstarter. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Adam says, in response to your reply to my last comment, my wife usually always beats me at games, so I'm used to loving games that I rarely win at. I lost my last two games of Wingspan. Growing up, I tended to win everything, but I very much married up when it comes to brain power. That's a nice, uh, nice thing to say about, about your relationship, Adam. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Megan usually beats me at games, too. Ali says, hello from London, UK. Lots of people from the from the UK or UK topics joining us today. He says, have you read any good books or comics recently? Do you have time to read with all the game design? Absolutely. Yeah, I read I read fiction every day. Um, that's how I fall asleep. I usually read um, whatever novel I'm, I'm reading at the time for about 30 to 45 minutes in bed before I fall asleep. And right now I am reading Harry Potter fan fiction. Um, uh, it's a it's a book called All the Young Dudes. It's a massive, massive book that follows the Marauders, if you're familiar with them, from Harry Potter as kids um, and as they're growing up, spe specifically uh, Remus Lupin. And it is so good. It's so good. I, I rarely read fan fiction for a a anything, really, but um, 
I saw some reviews and recommendations for it, and so I'm checking it out. It is a massive, massive book. It's taken me a few months to get through it. I'm still only at like 85%. But if you are, if any of you really are looking for to scratch a, uh, a Harry Potter itch, uh, but not reread the books and not J.K. Rowling, this author, I think, writes a better book than I think most of the actual Harry Potter books and brings in a lot of, um, a lot of, I think, important topics and perspectives, I don't want to spoil anything here, that aren't offered in the original Harry Potter books. So that's all the young dudes. It's a fan fiction about Harry Potter, and so it's available for free. It's not something they can sell, but it's available for free online if you search for that, uh, that title. I'm curious to see if anyone else reads that and let me know what you think. And for what we're watching right now, we usually watch a short show at lunch and a longer show at dinner. We are watching Raised by Wolves and Top Chef Season 18 at night. And during the day, we're watching a U.S. show called Abbott Elementary. Uh, just a nice co uh, comedy in the spirit of The Office, but in an in inner city school. And it's really, really good. It makes me miss The Office, but also it's it, like it is The Office in, in an elementary school. And so I'm, in, I'm enjoying that for what it is. Brian says, Clank Legacy was such an incredible experience right up there with Charterstone. That's quite a kind thing for you to say, Brian, because I, I hold Clank Legacy in, in very high regards among Legacy games. He says he absolutely loved Legacy Games where you're changing the board, the rule book. I wish there were more out there. There are a good number out there at this point, Brian. And if you're looking to scratch that itch, um, I'd recommend trying uh, Rise of Queensdale and uh, 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 the King, uh, King, the King's Dilemma. The King's Dilemma, I think. That one doesn't really change the board, but, uh, but you are making changes that impact, impact the world. Ali also says, you published with mainstream things, themes like Wingspan. You say that all uh, we, at the time when Wingspan came out, that uh, nature and birds were definitely were not a, a, a mainstream theme. And unusual themes like Scythe, you tend to have different mechanisms depending on how accessible the theme is at all. Well, that's interesting. Do I think about like the accessibility of the theme and, and as I design the mechanisms for a game or as I work with a designer like Elizabeth Hargrave for Wingspan? Um, I would say, I mean, accessibility is is on my mind no matter what the theme is and no matter what the mechanisms are and no matter what the weight of the game is. I'm, I, I want our games to get, to bring joy to any tabletop basically. And uh, so it, I would say I think about it no matter what the theme is and no matter what the mechanisms are. It's a great question, but, uh, but yeah, I would say it, it, accessibility is on my mind no matter what. Yeah. Gerben says, I played Libertalia for the first time last weekend and really enjoyed it. I noticed that there's quite a bit more take that in it than most of our games. I, for one, don't mind this, but since you often stay away from this, what was the choice to pick up this title to publish? I mean, a big part of the reason is that I, I love Libertalia. I love the original game um, and was excited by the opportunity to refresh it and put our own little spin on it with Palo, working with Palomori. Um, you're right that I typically, I mean, some of our games and myself as a gamer don't typically gravitate towards take that games. I think the reason I like it in Libertalia is that you are very, very randomly um, targeting a specific player because you, uh, it's the characters themselves who are doing the, the work for you. They are the ones that are targeting different characters, different, uh, different tokens, things like that. Um, so it can feel take that -y, but it really feels like someone is targeting me specifically when they do something that hurts me a little bit. It's more like, oh, that's how the order of the cards turned out on the, on the island, things like that. There are, I mean, the game does go beyond that a little bit. There are times where it says, okay, pick one of your neighbors and, and get rid of one of their tokens, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, and I think part of it is maybe the length of the game contributes to that a little bit. It isn't that long of a game. But yeah, I think the main thing is that most of the interaction is is not targeting players; it's targeting uh, circumstances, uh, characters, things, and, and things determined by the circumstances of the of the cards that are played simultaneously. Yeah. Tim says, "Do you think you'll do another rectangle box game like Viticulture, Euphoria, or Scythe?" Probably not. I think we've moved towards uh, having a fairly standard box size, even though there is no such thing as a standard box size. But well, we've moved towards having a similar size and different depths to the box um, so that our boxes look nice on people's shelves, which I think people like. However, I think we are more and more aware of um, 
shipping space and shelf space as well. And so if we have a game that doesn't need to take up that much space, we will reduce it in size in ways that, uh, that travel better and ship better too. We haven't had that happen in a while because we tend to pack a lot into our games, but, uh, but we, I do have that on my mind more than ever with our um, renewed focus, I would say, on eco-friendliness and uh, just the state of the world in terms of freight shipping. Josh says, he's been in love with Libertalia. It has come a long way since last year. Uh, got my coworkers playing it during lunch. Can't wait for Geekway. That's awesome, Josh. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Nazi says, will there be a social deduction game from Stomar Games? There, uh, oh, and just a quick comment. George says, Euphoria has a square box. It actually isn't quite square. It's, it's somewhat rectangular. It's very close to square, but it's not, it's not fully square. So Nazi, we actually do have one well, Euphoria does have some social deduction to it. Libertalia also does have a little bit to it too, but a full-on social deduction game. We don't have plans to do it. We thought about doing it years ago, but we ended up partnering with a different company. At the time, they were called uh, Overlord Games. I think it's now Pull the Pin Games. And they created a social deduction game called Leaders of Euphoria that is set in the world of Euphoria. So if you are looking for a Stonemeyer influenced and Stonemeyer world game that is social deduction, check out Leaders of Euphoria from uh, Pull the Pin Games. I believe they still have some copies on their web store. I'm not exactly sure. Peter says, speaking of prices, how are you finding shipping costs on your games? He says, I'm back in the latest Restoration Games Kickstarter and there are many complaints about the shipping costs for the games. However, Restoration is stating that this is just the new normal. It's unfortunate, but I suspect that Restoration is correct. It's just expensive. Not sure if you have the same experience. So we're talking about shipping. There are two different aspects here. One is the uh, shipping fees to for our fulfillment center to ship the game to you. We have seen them go up. Um, but those haven't gone up all that much, maybe a few dollars, but not all that much. Um, what we have seen, where we've seen the drastic increase in shipping costs are freight shipping. Freight shipping continues to be four to five times more expensive than it was around two years ago. And it doesn't seem to be changing, I think largely because companies are paying the costs. They're paying for it. I, I, I don't know what would happen if we all just stopped paying it for a while, but I don't think that's gonna happen either. So uh, yeah, we're paying significantly more for uh, to ship, like to ship Libertalia. If we wanted to ship Libertalia, freight ship it a couple years ago, it would have cost between three and $5. That's freight shipping from China to a fulfillment centers between three and $5 per unit. Probably on the lower end of that, probably around $3. Now to ship that copy, it, I think it costs around between $15 and $18 per copy. That's that's actually more than, than the production cost of Libertalia itself. Freight shipping is that expensive right now. So even though you're packing all these games into a shipping container, the, the cost is just so expensive. And I think, uh, I mean, that, that has a big impact on on things, uh, on, on how how shipping, how, how game prices are, 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 how high they are right now because of how high those, those freight shipping costs are. Yeah. Eric says, with the recent additions to Rolling Realms, especially the Terra Mystica Realm, whenever you're playing a non stomire game, have I been thinking about how that game would work as a realm? It's certainly on the back of my mind, especially if I really, really love a game. Uh, that Those are the games that I, are my first instinct to pursue a, a realm in. Um, yeah, definitely comes up in, uh, when I'm playing a game. Mark says, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Mark says, I'm glad I finally got the Libertalia board game and the promo realm. I saw that post in the Libertalia Facebook group recently, Mark. He says, I was having payment problems. Uh, oh, just sharing some stuff here. But Mark, yeah, thank you for sharing. I'm glad it finally came through. George says, do you have a regular game night each week with friends? For throughout the pandemic, we've been, well, throughout the beginning of the pandemic, we just did virtual game nights. Now what we do is every other week. So I have, I host a weekly game night in person on Wednesday. And then every other Wednesday, I host a weekly virtual game night with friends where we just get on Board Game Arena and play. And then on those nights where uh where we do the virtual game night i often the following day go to a friend's game night in person on thursdays so i usually have one to two game nights a week and i usually play games on the weekend either with megan or with some friends uh, as well but usually more low-key chris says any chance the new viticulture expansion will be at geekway um i can't speak to the exact timing yet chris because we're still waiting on the freight shipping to be finalized for certain elements of it but uh, it is looking that way. It is looking likely that we will have some copies of that expansion in the Geekway Play and Win section uh, in, in mid-May. It's looking like that right now. Can't promise that, but it's looking that way. Yeah. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that. I need to 
contact Geekway just to give them a heads up to, as to what's happening right now. Tony says the L on the cover of Libertalia kind of looks like a two. Was that a subtle design reference to the second generation version of the game? Um, it wasn't intentional, but I, it's kind of nice that it turned out that way. Yeah. David says the proboscis monkey, proboscis monkey. Yes, that was the one, David. Thank you for finding that. Yes, I spent a significant amount of the game trying to play the proboscis monkey in uh, in Ark Nova on my game this past Saturday. I thought it was an ape or a uh, 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 yeah, uh, an ape-like creature. Ali says, "What novel about whales? Some kind of fantasy." It was uh, it was a novel about Frank Lloyd Wright. Who, whose ancestors, who's a famous American architect, but his ancestors came from Wales and, uh, and I wanted to, to, I don't know, research it. it was, I, I haven't done anything with that novel for a long time, but I was fascinated for a long time by Frank Lloyd Wright, not just his architecture, but also him as a person. And um, so I, I went to Wales to, to research that novel, yeah. Lamp Games says, I'm an aspiring game designer and I'm creating my own publishing company. I just wanted to thank you for all you do for the board game community. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad you're getting some value out of my uh, my, my blog and, and maybe my YouTube channel as well. Nix says that they're excited for Geekway to the West. It will be our first time attending. It looks welcoming and fun. Thanks for recommending, recommending it to your viewers. I'm so glad you're giving it a try. It, it really is. Um, I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't love it. And I wouldn't recommend it if it wasn't welcoming and fun. It's very, very inclusive, very welcoming to all types of people and to newcomers and to families as well. Um, and I say this really, I repeat this every now and then. I am an introvert. I do not get excited about going to events with a lot of people that I don't know. But Geekway doesn't feel that way. Geekway, uh, the just the the tone that I think uh, the the convention helps set there is so welcoming that um, that as an introvert I, I just feel at home there and so uh, I'm glad you're coming with someone else but I, I even someone who wants to go to a convention by themselves I think you would feel very welcomed at Geekway even if you're an introvert like me but either way I'll be there and I'll be there to welcome you and definitely for any of you who are attending Geekway please come up and say hi I, I won't recognize you necessarily I can see your thumbnails here but it's very small faces and whatnot and it's very different in person and I'll probably be wearing a mask as well but uh, please come up and say hi I want to meet you I want to play games with you um, and, I'm, and I'm really looking forward to that Tim says do you ever look at the possibility of making the nesting box flat so that customers could assemble it I wonder if that would even work so yeah, that <laughs> I don't think it would work, Tim. It's an interesting idea. I don't think it would work for uh, structural integrity, but I like the out of the box thinking there uh, that you're looking at, which is saving a lot of space, space and freight shipping so that it doesn't cost as much. The one thing that we could consider, we're not gonna do it at this point for the nesting box, but um, if freight shipping continues like this, one thing we might consider is making a lot of components in China uh, where they're made really well and really efficiently um, and things that aren't even made in the U.S. at all and shipping those things to the U.S. and having them assembled here in the U.S. Uh, is something that we might, in, in particular the boxes especially because the boxes take up the most space. That's something that we might consider in the future for sure. Let's see, Chad has, says he's still reading through the 22 murders of Madison May and enjoying that recommendation. Thanks Chad for giving that a try. And Mark says, we might need a coin-based promo realm soon. Libertalia and Terra Mystica are both coinless realms, and it might be hard to score a perfect 18 with a random third realm. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I should do a realm that's more heavily focused on giving players coins, uh, since we do have a few realms that go light on the coins as well. Tim says, he's been enjoying Libertalia. Do I know any good dishes that you'd cook for a pirate-themed evening? That's a fun question. I'd probably go with something citrusy, maybe something with a citrus zest to avoid uh, to avoid scurvy. You want to avoid scurvy as a pirate, um, and maybe a fun take on hardtack. I think that's the the bread that pirates used to eat and sailors used to eat. So maybe some nice grilled bread. Uh, food is definitely on my mind recently because we started watching the, uh, the the last season of Top Chef, season eighteen, and it's it's fun to see them create some some good things. And one of the the chefs toasted uh, or or. I guess they pan fried pan seared. Maybe they grilled some bread. And I, I want to know what type of bread it was because it looks so light and fluffy. It doesn't look like it got crispy from the grill. It looks like it got light and fluffy. I want to figure out what bread that was. It may have been a brioche. Um, but let me know if, you, if any of you have ever grilled bread to get that nice sear on it and, uh, and put a little butter on there. 
Uh, let me know what type of bread that you recommend for grilling because I'd love to try that. What else is going on? Looking at my topics real quick before I get back to questions. I need a little water too. We watched a few pretty good movies over this past weekend. We watched the movie Turning Red on Disney Plus and watched The Atom Project on Netflix. It's a time travel movie. Turning Red is about puberty, I would say, with a, a, a fantastical twist to it. We enjoyed both of them. Both of them were pretty solid movies. Um, I, I enjoyed both of them quite a bit. And we also just started watching Survivor again as well. I forgot about that because Survivor comes out week to week, so we don't get to watch that every day. But uh, but the new season did start last Wednesday, and a new episode is tonight. I love Survivor. Love, love Survivor. And I'm excited to see what happens this season. And also, I almost forgot to mention, some of my coworkers are at Gamma. Gamma is a trade show, a, a game industry trade show, and it's in Reno this year. And Alex and Susanna and Joe are all there from time to time. So if you happen to be at Gamma and you're watching this for some reason, um, feel free to say hi to Alex, uh, Joe, and Susanna while they're there. I think that's all the topics that I had for today. So I will just focus on questions for the rest of the livecast. Thank you for all these wonderful questions and comments. Nicola says, I picked up Euphoria and Ignorance is Bliss this past weekend. Any fun tips for learning it and first plays? I'll be playing solo against the Altama. Uh, yeah, so you kind of have to learn two games there, Nicola. I do have some learning teaching tips, I believe, on the last page or maybe the second to last page of the rule book. Because Euphoria is a little hard to teach in particular. I don't think it's that hard to learn, but it's a little hard to teach. And so I have some key points in that rule book that might help a little bit. And then Altama, I don't have any tips for, for learning Altama. Um, but I think Altama writes a pretty good rule book. So if you just go by the rule book, you should be fine. Yeah. Tony says he loves the idea of the blank loot tile uh, in Libertalia. Yeah, we had one extra space on the punch board, and so we included a blank tile for you to create your own loot abilities. He says, any plans to sell additional blank tiles in the Summer Games store? We don't. We don't. I, I appreciate you asking about that, Tony, but that would be uh, logistically difficult. It's always difficult to add an a la carte item to the web store. It needs to be something that we, that we really need to add before we consider doing it. Um, but I'm glad you're having fun with it. And there might be special exceptions where uh, it might not be something that we can list, but if you contact us through the replacement parts form and offer to pay for it, we might consider it then if uh, in, in the right circumstance. Yeah. Uh, Justin says, uh, speaking of box sizes, I found an interesting video on the sizes of video game box sizes for games in the 80s. The person talks about people who set the standard. It's a longer video, but it is one of my favorite long form content creators on YouTube. Search big boxes by Ahoy. Interesting. Yeah, thanks for talking, uh, mentioning that. And I, I, it, it is odd how certain things become standardized as they are also popularized and the reasons for it. I need to watch this video to see the exact reason for what happened there. Um, but really, I mean, there, there is no like, there's no box making machine that can only make boxes of one size. You just, you can set the size to whatever dimensions you want. Um, there just happen to be certain game box sizes that end up being more standard than others. Nathan says, I know you like Obsession, the game board game Obsession, and I finally got a chance to play. Solid game. He played with Maggie of Think Your Themer at the Dice Tower West. That's awesome. I'm jealous that you got to play with Maggie. You can see a picture of us playing in Think Your Themer's most recent video where I happen to be sporting my Stomire Champion t-shirt. Oh, that's awesome. That is so cool, Nathan. I am very jealous of you and also very happy that you got to play a game with Maggie. Um, I haven't gotten to meet Maggie or Amy in person yet. They live very far away, but I, I just adore them as people and as creators. They add just such... Such light, I think, to the world and the industry and the community in every one of their videos. Uh, George says, thank you for your weekly Stonemaier Games articles. I like reading them a lot. Thank you, George. That's very kind of you to say. Um, just, this is a very nice comment here. I'll read it, but it, yeah, it warms my heart that you said this, George. He says, I think you add a great value to the industry through them. They are fast and quality read, perfect to read during coffee breaks or when you are on the road. P.S. You got me there with a square box of euphoria. Yeah, it's almost square, but just not quite. And thank you again. That's very kind of you to say. Darren says, aside from Russia and Ukraine themselves, has the conflict affected business in Europe at all? So I do have a recent blog post about how tragic, truly tragic this con this conflict is and what we are doing to try to aid our, to lend our support to Ukraine and uh, to deny support to Russia. Um, beyond that, though, it, it does not seem to have impacted business in Europe at this point. No. Um, and I hope it doesn't. Uh, not for the business level, but for, on the humanitarian level. I hope the conflict stops completely, um, but also definitely I hope that it does not spread any further. Um, but most of all, I hope it just stops. It's, it's, 
it, it is still uh, shocking and baffling and disheartening and sad and angering to me that uh, that that a country would try to conquer another country in in uh, in especially in this day and age. It's incredible to me. Uh, Tim says the printer for my for my new book decided to send my first batch in over 20 different packages, some with only tw two to three books. I wish more companies would think about the environment. One or two boxes would have would have sufficed. That is a very odd choice, Tim. In fact, we related to that. We recently heard from our Canadian fulfillment center that they have, for certain multi item um, orders, they have been shipping them in separate boxes. And that to us, they said that it's more cost uh, effective for some reason based on the, the postal costs. But uh, but it was a little baffling to us and, and we from the eco friendliness perspective of it or unfriendliness perspective of it. So we're digging in, into that. Uh, and even if it costs a little bit more, I think we'd rather consolidate them into one box. Sean says, are, are there any companies like Panda that are local to your distribution centers? Would that offset the shipping? Um, so we've got to use a few different terms here, Sean. Uh, fulfillment centers, I think is the term you're going for, because they Panda ships to our fulfillment centers. Um, they also do ship directly to distributors. Distributors are the companies that sell to retailers. Um, but yeah, depending on the size of the shipment, we coordinate ship me, shipping from Panda in China, uh, which is also shut down right now due to, due to COVID. We coordinate shipping directly from Panda to uh, distributors and directly to fulfillment centers. But no, there are no distributors or fulfillment centers that are local to uh, Shenzhen in, in, in China that we work with, at least. Nir says, how much, how much would those shipping costs need to go up more to not justify manufacturing in China? It's really, I mean, unfortunately, it is not about the cost. And, uh, and, and I love, I, I really, really love working with Panda. I think Panda is a wonderful company. They are a Canadian company with their main factory in, in, in China. Uh, their communication is incredible. Their quality is incredible. And I think they treat their employees really well. So, uh, I do not have uh, a stigma against working with a, a Chinese company, specifically Panda. Um, but it's not about cost so much as there are lots of things that are made for our games that are simply not made in the U.S. And even there are some game public game, game manufacturers in the U.S. There are a few, like Delano. Delano made uh, uh, the Stardew Valley game, and Ludofact also has a factory here in, in the U.S. But even they have to outsource some components, a number of components from China, and they bring it into their factory and they assemble it in their factory. Uh, so. China is it is the manufacturing center of the world, especially for um, especially for games. And so that, yeah, it's just uh, I, I would I would love for there to be other options, other viable options, uh, just because I like having I like having options, especially within Panda. I would love for Panda to have some of those options in the U.S. so I can continue to work with Panda, but also not have to freight ship things across the ocean to get them to uh, U.S. customers. Um, but in the end, you have to keep this in mind too. No matter where you make something, if you are a worldwide company, and we are a company that tries to bring joy to tabletops worldwide, no matter where you make it, you are going to have to ship it somewhere at some point outside of that fulfillment, that, that manufacturing center. So um, even if we found a great way to make games in the U.S. and we were able to somehow make everything here in the U.S., uh, we would still need to send ships of games to Europe and ships of games to Australia and New Zealand and, and, and truck games up to Canada or send them on a train up to Canada and send them around the world to other, other areas and send them back to Asia, send them over to Asia. So uh, it's a, with a worldwide economy, you're going to have to freight ship things at some point anyway. Paul says he's, he's a huge fan of some of our games. Thank you, Paul, for, for being a fan, being a supporter of our games. And he has a question about Charterstone. We play a bunch of titles, and I'm afraid that we would need to play this exclusively to properly enjoy it. Is this a game that could sit for a week or two and not lose the impact, or would we forget what was going on? Um, that's a good question, Paul. I think I mean I think legacy games are best played when you play them a few weeks in a row. When we played, when I played my most recent campaign of Charterstone, it actually got interrupted by the pandemic halfway through. So we played uh, three weeks in a row got through half the campaign, it's 12 games, and then the pandemic hit, and we finally got together last year and played the final three sessions of, uh, of, the, of the campaign to finish it. Um, I do think it's best played week to week, or at least like, you know, every other week for a while until you finish it, playing two, two games per session if you can. But the game also does, 
I mean, I designed it so that, and I think this is really important when designing campaign games. I designed it so that you could put it away and forget about it for a while if you needed to or wanted to and come back to it. And the game doesn't require you to remember anything. The rule book, the setup for the rule book treats you every time as if you've forgotten everything and you read through the rule book and go through it step by step again, especially the setup. And uh, I also tried to do things to remind players of stuff that's already happened so you don't have to use your memory for those types of things. So, uh, yeah, that's my that's my answer to it. And I will give a shout out to another game that I think does the second aspect of that really well. Role Player Adventures, not a legacy game, but a campaign game, I think does a really, really good job every time you sit down to play of reminding you of the important things and the important characters that you've already encountered um, so that you don't have to remember that stuff for that, that play. If you have... If it has been a while since you've played the last session of Roleplayer Adventures. But we tried to do that in Charterstone as well. Chet says, Scythe and Tapestry are your only current games that break the 90-minute time estimate. Tapestry is the highest at 120 minutes. Is two hours the highest that you plan to go with your future designs? Yeah, I mean, I, I like 90 minutes as the sweet spot. 60 to 90, really. But for a more epic game, I like going for 90. Um, especially because with teaching, a 90-minute game is going to go a little bit longer. And with higher player counts, a 90 minute game will generally go a little bit longer. So if I aim for 60 to 90, then I'm, I'm fairly confident that the game will actually will finish in no more than two hours, which I think is a standard length for game night. Uh, Tim chimed in about Geekway and feeling welcome. And he says he, he felt uh, welcome at Geekway in October. And I'm so glad to hear that, Tim. And I'm glad you're bringing your wife in May. That's wonderful. I get to play games not just with you, but with your wife in May. That's awesome, Tim. Sean says, uh, non. Yeah, non does work on the grill. I do, I, yeah. I haven't ever cooked non from scratch before, um, but I probably could. Steven says, fun scurvy fact. British sailors got the nickname Limeys because the British Navy discovered that, that limes in the diet reduced the incident, incidence of scurvy. Didn't know that. That's cool. Fun fact from Steven. Uh, Aaron says, any chance we might see more expansions for for Tapestry and Scythe? The ones you've done are, are so far great, but I'm great. I want even more. Um, for Scythe, we have definitely said that uh, the Scythe tabletop game is complete. We're not coming out with new accessories. We're not coming out with new expansions. The story, the, the trilogy of expansions tell the story of the, the game Scythe that, that we wanted to tell. So um, if you have all the side stuff, it is definitely complete. We will continue to reprint that stuff and support the game, but uh, the story and and uh, stuff for Scythe, the tabletop game, are complete. We haven't said that about Tapestry, but we also haven't said it either way about Tapestry. Yeah. George says, try grilling bread in the oven with olive oil and afterwards scrunch some garlic on the bread and put it in for three minutes more. That sounds really good. I like the idea of putting some fresh garlic on it. I often just use garlic powder, but I forget that putting some fresh garlic on it and baking it really, really makes it taste good. Darren says, Stomar has a, rep has a reputation for having customers who will buy your games with minimal research. Are there any companies that you feel that way about? And I should say that's I, I appreciate that from customers, but I also appreciate um, even our most loyal fans being discerning. I know not every game is for everyone, and I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to make sure that we are always making games that bring the most joy to you. And we, if we ever stop doing that, um, don't buy our games. Buy, buy the games that bring you the most joy. Um, are there any companies? There are definitely companies and designers and even artists that, uh, that make me pull the trigger very, very quickly. But even then, I, I'm still somewhat of a discerning customer. For example, I love Ryan Lockett's games. I love uh, Keith Mateska's games at uh, Thunderworks. Um, those are two that come to mind off the top of my head. Paul, Paul Denon uh, from, uh, from uh, 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 Dire Wolf Games, who's done Clank and, and Clank Legacy, uh, and, 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 and uh, Dune Imperium. I love their games, but I still like to research a game when it comes out to find out if it is a good fit for me. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think there are many publishers or designers that are true auto purchase, but they but I get, I get really excited about certain um, designers, publishers, Elizabeth Hargraves too. I, I know she designed wingspan for, for us, but, uh, but yeah, anything Elizabeth puts out there, I am instantly intrigued by it for sure. George says an, an idea about how to celebrate a future Stormar games uh, anniversary, make a book about all Stormar games with insights from the designers, pictures, stories, etc., along with Stormar goals and statistics. That is really cool. I like that, George. 
Um, we do have our 10th anniversary coming up. So I know that there isn't time for me to do that for the 10th anniversary. We have some other, other stuff planned for that, but I really do like that idea for the future. I appreciate you bringing that up. I'm going to um, copy and paste that idea on my ideas chart because that's a really cool idea for an anniversary. Where is my little chart here? I should probably keep talking while I do this. We only have a few more minutes and behind on questions. Tim says he had over a year between games one and two of Charterstone. That's a big time. He said, would prefer to play in a shorter time period, but it's still fun either way. I'm glad to hear that, Tim. You probably had to like relearn the rules at that point, which is almost what we had to do after having that break in the middle as well. You have to relearn some things, but I think the rule book does a pretty good job of helping with that. Molly says, during the live cast, her copy of Libertalia and Rolling Realms ar arrived in real time. That's awesome, Molly. I'm glad to hear that. Good timing. Suzanne says that she blinged out Charterstone during the lockdown. Talk about immersive. That's awesome, Suzanne. Brent says his wife is a big, big on Stillmeyer games. My sister-in-law loves in Libertalia that everyone has the same cards and hates the take that mechanic. We own Wingspan, Viticulture, Red Rising, and Libertalia. Do you have another suggestion of a Stillmeyer game we should go to, given those games? Also, thank you for introduce, introducing me to the Red Rising books through your game, which I always love to hear. So Wingspan, Viticulture, Red Rising, and Libertalia. What other game from Stormar Games would I recommend that you offshoot then? Probably Euphoria. I definitely put, I think Euphoria hits a couple of those sweet spots in there. Let me look at our, our list here. Yeah, Euphoria comes to mind first. Um, and I would probably throw, I know it's a very different game. I mean, I, I'd probably throw Tapestry in there. Probably Pendulum. I'd probably go Euphoria first. And then Pendulum, if you want something a little bit different, but it, it still hits some of those, scratches some of those itches. Tapestry, I have to throw in there too, because I think it also scratches some of those itches, but maybe it's a little, little longer than some of those games. Viticulture can be a longer game too, though. So I'd do Euphoria, Pendulum, and then once you get up to four or five games in the Stonebar Games collection that you enjoy, um, I'd get Rolling Realms, because Rolling Realms gives you a mini experience of many of our games in a very short time frame. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think once you get up to four or five similar games, you could start to really, really enjoy Rolling Realms. Although I think you can also enjoy Rolling Realms without having played any of our games before. Sean says maybe Panda could have localized facilities to assemble their components. Yeah, that's, that's what I, I'm hoping they'll do someday. Um, that's a lot of localized facilities if they want to hit all the, the major areas of the world, like Europe, the US slash Canada, North America, basically, um, and Australia, New Zealand. But I think it could be possible someday. Ryan says, his wife and I have been loving our games of Libertalia Winds of Gilcrest, wondering about adding the Automa mode to our two-player games. Seems like it could work well. You're welcome to try it, but it is not designed for that purpose. Yeah. Daniel says, one visit to the Summer Game Store, and now I'm a champion, and I got four sets of metal mechs and some eggs for Wingspan. Wow, that's a, that's a big all-in starter purchase there, Daniel. Thank you for, for doing that. I hope you enjoy the metal mechs. Uh... Let's see. Chad says it's... Oh, in fact, that reminds me of something that I need to look into. Thank you, Daniel. Chad says it's interesting how the time on the box is estimated. Do you include the setup and teardown in your time? Do you use the max player count or the average? Do you estimate the time based on players who, who already know the rules? Sorry for so many questions. So what I do for that is I use uh, mostly the average... Well, I use the range of time times reported to us by play testers and that time is supposed to include setup um play time and cleanup it doesn't include the rules explanation but it does include setup and cleanup yeah and that's for all the play test data that we've gathered while play testing the game steven says uh garp hill game yeah garp hill game is a company that always intrigues me for sure i don't buy every game but it always intrigues me it gets me excited these are, uh, as Stephen also mentioned, Stefan Feld and Andrew Bosley. Bosley. Yeah, Andrew's art always uh, intrigues me and gets me gets me interested in, what, in what's going on in the game. You know, it looks like we reached the last comment. Brent will get the honor of the last comment uh, right at 11 o'clock. So this is perfect timing. Thank you all for joining me today, for asking this question, sharing your comments, your thoughts, your insights, and your perspectives as always. And I'll be back. Um, I'll be back live for Rolling Realms on Saturday sometime in the Rolling Realms group if you want to play along with me. I don't know what time yet. Uh, and then Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then I'll be back as usual next Wednesday to chat live with you again. All right. Take care. Have a great week. I'll see you. Bye.